right? All right. So here it is in the International Standard Version, John chapter 3, verse 3 through 8. Jesus replied to Nicodemus, Truly, I tell you with certainty, unless a person is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus asked him, How can a person be born when he's old? He can't go back into his mother's womb a second time and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, I tell you with certainty, unless a person is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Water and spirit. When you're born, you are encased in water. In the natural, I'm talking about. All right? Everybody that had a baby knows this. Right? Born of water. That's what he's talking about. Unless you have come through natural birth. That's the first thing he's saying. Unless a person is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now here's where he says it. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't be astonished that I told you all of you must be born from above. That's the international standard, and I don't think we have it to show you up above, but the international standard. Don't be astonished that I told you all of you must be born from above. So Jesus is making a distinction between flesh and spirit. Flesh and spirit. Do you know you cannot connect to God in your flesh? You can't. You can't connect to God in your flesh. You can only connect to God via your spirit. Via your spirit. That's why Jesus said, if you're not born from above, you can't even see the kingdom of God. You won't understand the kingdom of God. It's like trying to preach to somebody that doesn't know Jesus, hasn't been born from above, and they look like you, as Pastor said, as a cattle at a new gate. Because it, it's falling on deaf ears, so to speak. The only thing they'll hear is the gospel, the good news. God loves you. God sent his son for you. He took your place. That's the only thing they'll hear. All right? That's the only thing they'll hear. Jesus said that. You can't see the kingdom of God. These principles that we teach in church, prosperity and healing, I mean, you can demonstrate. Jesus says, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. You can demonstrate, but you can't just preach to somebody about the kingdom of God because they can't see it unless they're born from above. All right, so, and Jesus made a distinction saying all, all must be born from above. Well, why is that? Do you know that science, not that you all need anything validated by science because we have the word of God, but do you know that science has now proven that every single human came from the same woman? Do you know that? It's been proven. DNA markers have shown that every single human came from the same woman. Woman. And that woman's name was, everybody says Eve. Everybody says Eve, because that's what we've been taught. That's the English word for her name, Eve. But her name was actually life. Life. When Adam named Eve, he said, your name is life life because you are the mother of all living the mother of all living so he called her life and that was her second name and we're going to look at that in a minute isn't it interesting i was thinking about this pastor preached last week i believe when he was talking about identity crisis and and he was saying that our identity is now in christ and once you have a new identity in christ you get a new name paul got a new name or Saul, I should say. Saul got a new name, he's Paul. Peter got a new name, he's... No. Simon got a new name, he's Peter. Sarah got a new... Sarah, I got a new name, Sarah. Abram got a new name, Abraham. Eve got a new name. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Scriptures will show you that what I'm saying is true, but there's actually documented evidence that every human came from the same woman. Um, there's an article, I just, it's fascinating to me, so I just wanted to share it with you. The first article I found is in um, The Ancient Origins, and it's a website that talks a lot about 
genealogy and things like that. But it actually says that in 1987, that's a long time ago, in 1987, they did some DNA tracking that suggested that all human beings were born from the same woman. They all came from the same woman. 1987. But then in 2013, a study showed that every man, every man alive can trace his origin to one man. So now, and that man, they say, lived the same time that woman did. Fancy that. All they had to do was go to their Bible. <laughs> right? That's all they had to do was go to their Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. God said, let us make man in our own image, in the image of man. Male and female created he them. That's all they had to do was go to the Bible. So science now um, can prove what the Bible says is true. Wow. Isn't that fancy? Wow. But what's really cool is the way they word this on CBN. Yes, CBN News. CBN News. It says, new findings throw doubt into the patterns of evolution currently accepted. Woo! How about that? New findings throw doubt into the patterns of evolution. Ha! Isn't that something? And they said that there are barcodes of the DNA that reveal that species fall into very distinct, widely separated populations. It means that what the Bible says is they're created by their kinds is true. Wow. Man didn't come from monkeys. Fancy that. And science has proven it. Of course it is. Because science is all about God. God's the one that invented science. Man just had to catch up with it, you know? But you could save them a lot of time if they read the Word of God. <laughs> so it's really, really interesting, um, all of these studies about the barcodes, and it says, but it says that when we refer to our fellow man, and the whole world should be hearing this right now, when we refer to our fellow man, we are actually referring to our genetic brothers and sisters. Yeah. That's CBN News. Yeah. We're actually referring to our brothers and sisters. But if you would, if you'll turn with me to Genesis, because as I said, we're going to talk about Eve. Eve, the mother of all life. Eve is the mother of all life. And that's Genesis chapter 3. Now... Um, this guy's not going to cooperate with me, I think. All right. Now, Genesis chapter 3 is the account of the fall of man. And I, this isn't the lesson uh, teaching on that today. So suffice it to say, you already know how that all transpired. Um, and it's that they were tempted and they took the temptation and they disobeyed God and they fell. They fell from grace. So they were stripped of their dignity. So now they're hiding from God. And when God comes um, and ca calling to them, it's not, not because he didn't know where they were. He was giving them an opportunity to come forth. You understand? Um, excuse me, my tablet is giving me little fits here. All right, so we'll just go... <clears throat> So, God calls to Adam, and he says, Adam, where are you? Verse 10, Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree I commanded you not to eat? And the woman, and the man said, the woman you gave me to be with me she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. The Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Now notice they both did confess, I did eat. 
okay? Sometimes we gloss over that, but they did confess. We, we've spent many a message point, you know, noticing that they point at each other, they blame each other and all of that, and they were hiding. But notice they did confess, I did eat. Both of them, all right? Both of them, I did eat. And so then the Lord pronounces to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon your belly you shall go, and thus shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise. What shall bruise? The seed, her seed, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over there. And Adam, he said, unto Adam, he said, because you have, eat, you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow you will eat of it all the days of your life. So that sounds like a whole lot of pain going on, right? Pain, sorrow. Now, verse 18, thorns, thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and you shall eat the herb of the field. 19, in the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. But now look at this, verse 20. Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. That tells me Adam believed and accepted what God just told him. And that was that her seed would bruise the head of their enemy. So Adam had faith. When you hear what God says and you accept it as truth, faith comes in your heart. Then Adam acts on that faith by naming her something different. Because before that, he called her woman. In Genesis chapter 1, he called her woman, Aisha. But here, he gives her a new name, and he calls her life, Kava. So that tells me he believed what God said. God declared to him, her seed is going to fix this mess. It's not quite the picture what we've always thought, is it? that God is standing over them like an ogre, pronouncing horrible judgment on them. You see, they were cursed because of what they did. God didn't curse them. He declared the curse was there because of what they did. He loved them. Because if you'll remember, at the, in that position, they are now hiding from God, and clothed with something they made themselves. They took fig leaves, ladies of substance have had this lesson extensively, but they took fig leaves and sewed them together to make themselves aprons, which means armor. So they're in a position where they're hiding from God and they're in self-protect mode because they have been stripped of their dignity because of their disobedience. Subscribing to what the enemy said, so they're in that hiding position when God finds them. He declares what's happening. He says, her seed's going to fix this mess. Adam believes it. And the next thing God does is gives them a new set of clothes. So right away, you can see the exchange happen. He says, you don't need that way of hiding. You don't need that way of self-protecting anymore. I got you covered. That's what, that's what God said to them in Genesis chapter 3. You don't need that way anymore. I got you covered. I got you covered. 
And that's the very first declaration when God says her seed. That's the very first declaration of the scarlet thread that would be woven through history until Jesus arrives. But in the meantime, there's a whole lot of boys and girls being born. Right? A whole lot of men and women living life. Did you ever ask yourself, how was it how was it that these books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, how was it these books got written? Moses wrote Genesis. How was it Moses knew about this going on? Was he there peeking through the woods, watching what's happening? Huh? No, he was not. Well, if Adam believed what God said, he's going to start talking about it to his progeny. He's going to start telling his sons and his daughters what happened. He's going to start telling it. Right? He's going to start telling it. And that is the culture of the day. Even now in Judaism, they tell it. You, they have records for everything. They write it all down. They still write it all down. They still can trace genealogy all the way back to Adam and Eve. Because they write it all down and have always written it all down because God told them to. Yeah. And he also told them to tell your children. Tell your children. Tell your children. Tell your children. So I believe Ab Adam did. Now, yes, Moses started hearing from God on his own. That's how a man writes the scriptures in the first place. Holy men of God, hearing from the Holy Ghost, right? But it doesn't just fall off and hit you in the head, you know. I mean, yeah, there's some interaction here with humanity going on. That sometimes we just play stupid, I think. You know, I'm not trying to be insulting, but sometimes we just read the scriptures and just get our funny little pictures of what really happened. And it's like, dig a little deeper. Dig a little deeper. We're talking about humanity here. You know humanity. You are one. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you is one. <laughs> you is one. All right. So, all right. I want to, I'm just going to read a couple of things on this same thing about Eve. So the whole story in Genesis is a prototype. Okay? It's a picture. It's a prototype of the original pattern, the process of temptation, yielding to temptation, Repentance and restoration. We saw that. Temptation came to the woman, right? She partook. Adam partook. So there's the temptation. There's the yielding to temptation. And then there's the repentance. We sh I'm showing you Adam repented because he heard what God said. And he changed his wife's name. So if you ever wondered, is Adam going to be in heaven? I believe it's yes. I believe he will. Because I believe his actions show us he repented. He could have refused the clothing God gave him. Oh, no, we're good, thanks. I got fig leaves doing me just fine. I don't need any help, God. I'll stay hiding, thank you very much. He didn't do that. He, rather, he came out, he heard what God had to say, he accepted it as truth, and he acted on it. That's how we get saved. Right? Hear it? Accept it as truth? Say it? Right? All right. And then so we know restoration, there was that exchange. God clothed them in place of what they were trying to clothe themselves with. Okay. All disobedience brings death. God set that up. Sin is missing the mark. That's what the word sin means. It means to miss the mark of the highest. God's the highest. It's his standard, not ours. Not our friends, not our neighbors, not our politicians. It's his standard that we live towards. His standard. He's the one that sets the bar, not us. He sets the bar, not us. Not what we think about it, not our opinion, not what we feel about it, what he says about it. God sets the standard. It's his standard. Yes. That seems very important. 
in this day and age. There have to be people that accept that, that it's God's standard we're living up to, God's way, not our way, not what we think about it, not our opinion about it. So death brings separation. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. Death brought separation, not cessation, separation. They were separated from God. Okay? So they're separated. Death brings separation. I'm just making sure I don't... All right. So where are we at now with the position of humanity? Well, the Savior's coming as far as the perspective of Adam and Eve. The whole book, Genesis to Revelation, before that, actually, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the whole book is painting the picture of the arrival of the seed. The whole book. Noah, it's painting a picture of the arrival of the seed. Noah's life was about, about protecting that seed. What seed? The seed that came from Eve in the first place, the mother of all life. She's the mother of all life. And that seed has been propagated, born again, born again, born again, born again, born again. You understand? Generations, generations, generations. And the seed of Jesus is in there, and he's coming. That seed has to be protected. That's what Noah was all about. All right? No questions on that? Okay. So... Now we pick up to coming where we're at today. She's the mother of all life. DNA shows we've all come from her, right? Jesus came from her. Jesus came from her. It might make a little adjustment on how we think about her, right? Had she not been? Had Adam fallen before Eve was made? It's just something to think about. Had Adam fallen before Eve was made? Wow. So, yes, if it weren't for Eve, there'd be no sin. If it weren't for Eve, there'd be no Savior. It was his seed. The seed of the woman. Jesus, the Redeemer, was the seed of the woman. And it says that we've been crucified with Christ. So that substitution again we see happening. We, he took our place, made the great exchange, the substitution. She's the mother of all life. Let's look at, I want to look at, I think we're going to look at Romans 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Bringing us up to present day, where we're at. See, we think we have a flesh problem. Jesus said that which is of the flesh is flesh. That which is of the spirit is spirit. And many times we tell ourselves, we have a flesh problem. We have a flesh problem. I have a flesh problem. I have a flesh problem. I just can't keep my flesh on. I just don't know. I don't know. I did it again. I have a flesh problem. Well, what does God say about that? Romans chapter 6, verse 6, it says, We know that our old unrenewed self was nailed to the cross with him in order that our body which is the instrument of sin might be made ineffective ineffective and inactive for evil that we might no longer be the slaves of sin i think this is amplified 
We know our old unrenewed self was nailed to the cross with him. Okay, think about that. The unrenewed. So the word flesh, it could be the sarks. It could be your body that it's talking about in the Bible. Flesh is this that you see. Or it could be your old nature. The nature that Adam and Eve had after they fell. Okay, that's what it's talking about. It's either talking about your body or it's talking about your old nature. All right? And in this verse, it's being pretty specific about both. We know our old unrenewed self, okay, that's the old nature, was nailed to the cross with him in order that our body, that's our flesh, which is an instrument of sin, or you could say a vessel, in order that our body as an instrument of sin would be ineffective and inactive for evil. That we might no longer be the slaves of sin. In other words, sin can't tell you what to do. Your body can't tell you what to do. Yeah, right? <laughs> okay, let's look at Galatians chapter 5. Verse 24, Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. It says, those who belong to Christ, the Messiah, Jesus Christ is the Messiah, those who belong to Christ, the Messiah, 524, Galatians 524, have, have crucified the flesh. In parentheses, it says the godless Human nature. The God, let's amplify, that's right. Those who belong to Christ, the Messiah, have crucified the flesh. The godless human nature. With, 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 with its passions, its appetites, and its desires. Come on now. Those who belong to Christ have crucified. Yeah. Not gonna. Yeah. Not might. Have. Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, the Messiah, have crucified. Amen. Have. 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 Yeah. And not just the flesh, the godless human nature, not just, the, not just but also the passions, the appetites, and uh, its desires. Yeah, that's good. So what's the problem? What's, what's the problem? I mean, either you're dead or you're, de or you're not dead. Which one is it? Are you dead or are you not dead? Clearly, he's talking about our old nature and our flesh. And clearly you can see I'm walking around here in my body. But I got a different driver. Yeah. You see. The old nature isn't driving the, b the bus anymore. That was a bad choice of words. Could have been a Maserati or something. <laughs> 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 Mustang. I say bus. Well, so what's the problem? What's the problem? There's a problem. It's called phantom flesh. That's what the problem is. Phantom flesh. There is a, there is a uh, medical diagnosis for amputees. And it's called phantom limb syndrome. Phantom limb syndrome. My grandfather had this. My grandfather had his hand um, amputated um, during a farming, ac a, a farming accident. Uh, corn would go up uh, what they call an escalator. When we hear escalator, we think shopping. And I was always afraid to ride a, an escalator. I still am. Because <laughs> that word goes in my head. Ah, I'm going to lose my hand. <laughs> but it was a farming escalator. <laughs> yeah. 
and he lost his hand. He lost his hand as a young person. So didn't you have a grandpa that lost a hand or something? Yeah. And so now, oh, that's kind of weird, huh? I wonder what that means. You think there's some spiritual significance for that? <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> just being funny you know that <laughs> anyway so my grandfather lost his hand and so he just had a he just had a stump but he many times would say his hand was itching him his hands itching him what grandpa your hand is not there I know but it's itching and he would just scratch that nub he'd have a little sock on it he never did get a new hand but he had a little sock on it man he'd have to take that sock off and he just scratch that little nub because it was itching but it wasn't there so, there's actually a syndrome. They call everything is a syndrome, you know, in the medical world. Everything's a syndrome, but they call it phantom limb syndrome. And now they're starting to discover that there's therapies for this, therapies for phantom limb syndrome. So, Brother Jesus is going to help me demonstrate the therapy for phantom limb. Now, I was going to wrap one of his appendages in black, but. We're just going to pretend for the sake of pretending. Uh, I think we're, what we'll have you do is sit. We'll have you sit on the, yeah. Can everybody see him if he sits here, or do you need him higher? You can see him? You can sit on a stool. That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. So phantom limb therapy is, is a real therapy. They actually do it. Um, there's a Dr. Chow, I think is how he says it. He was working with a sergeant and they videotaped it. And I really should have showed you the video, but I thought this will work just as well. So what you're going to do is you're going to sit sideways. Okay. And then um, we're going to pretend that his right arm is missing. Okay. His right arm is missing. He lost it in the war and his right arm is missing. But that right arm has been causing him extreme pain. Typically, the phantom limb limb syndrome is pain not an itch like my grandpa's was it's extreme pain well yeah so he's having extreme pain <laughs> so what we're going to do then is we're going to put the mirror up like this all right and then he's going to respond to what i tell him to do with his hand i want you to wave at the mirror with your hand then i want you to w wiggle your fingers with your hand. And while you're doing that, I want you to watch it in the mirror. Okay? And then I want you to snap your fingers in, in huh? Uh huh? And then I want you to make a fist. And then I want you to stretch your hand out. All right, so that's what they do to patients that come in. You're will, not in your head, so you're familiar with this, Will. Okay. All right. So if it was a leg, they'd put the mirror between his legs, of course, and they'd have him wiggle the foot up and down. What they're doing is resurrecting the limb that's missing. They're telling the brain it's still there and it doesn't hurt and it works just fine. Okay? That's what they're doing. So, so the patient has reported they can feel him wiggling his fingers in his other hand. So they exercise every day with the mirror to say, you're fine. This is what you look like this is how you function. This is what you do. A hundred percent of the patients lose all phantom limb syndrome. One hundred percent. Thank you very much. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. So what that tells me is <laughs> we have a part of us that's been severed from us. The old man. The old man has been severed from us. And we have a new man. So we need to spend time looking in the mirror to see how right that new man is. To see how that new man functions and what that new man looks like. The word of God is called the mirror. That is the therapy for the phantom flesh syndrome that so many of us have. That's the therapy. It's not looking at the problem. Man, I can't just, I just can't get a grip on this. I keep going back to it. I keep going back to it. I keep going back to it. 
I can't get over it. I can't get over because you're still looking at the limb that's been amputated. That's why. That's why they keep feeling the pain. The arm is gone. The arm is gone, but I still feel it. The arm is gone. I still feel it. I still feel the pain. The arm is gone. I still feel the pain. My flesh is gone, but I still feel it. I still feel the pain. I still feel the pain. The flesh is gone. The flesh is dead, but it's still telling me what to do. It's still telling me what to do because you're still looking at it. You're still looking at it. You're still looking at what you used to do, what you want to do, what your flesh wants to do. That's why when we, when Pastor and I, we went through treatment many years ago, and thank God for the wisdom of God because it was totally Holy Ghost that got us through. But we, we did go through treatment, but once we were free of treatment, we stayed free of treatment. And it totally had to be God because we knew in our hearts we cannot go to AA. Personally, he and I, we believed we could not go there. We could not go and stand up and confess, hi, I'm Dina, I'm an alcoholic. Because if I had done that, I still would be. I'd still be, I'd still be, I'd still be, I'd still be. Because that's what I'm looking at. That's what I'm looking at. So we don't promote that. I mean, how do I say? We uh, have AA here because it has helped people stay dry long enough, like us, in many cases, to stray dry long enough so they can start hearing truth. Yeah. So it worked for us in that regard, but we couldn't camp there. We couldn't stay there. We had to get in the word. We had to get in the mirror. We had to start seeing who we really are, who Jesus made us to be. It says we're created in his image and his likeness. So we have to be in the mirror looking, what does Jesus look like? Yeah. What does Jesus look like? Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's not giving me any pain anymore at all. Yeah. It feels just fine. You see? Because it's shame that drives us. That's pain. Shame is pain. And that was the fall. That was the result of the fall. Shame was the result of the fall. If you remember, it says in Genesis, when they were first created, they were naked and not ashamed. But then after they fell, they were filled with shame. So shame is the result of fall, the fall, and shame is pain. Shame is pain. So it's like, it still hurts. I got to fix it. 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 It's because you're looking at the hurt. You're looking at the hurt. So instead, you look at Jesus. Jesus became our substitute. He took our place. So now he is what we look at. And it says he despised the shame. He despised the shame. Meaning he didn't count it. He didn't, he didn't count it. He, he, uh, how do I say that best? Lord, help me. Despising, uh, we think hate. I hate that. That's not what he meant. When he says he despised the shame... He uh, disesteemed it. Disesteemed it. You're not gonna, you're not gonna hurt me no more. That's the best way I can say it. That's how he looked at shame. You're not gonna hurt me anymore. But he took our shame. He took it. That's another part of the redemption package in the substitution. Is any shame that we had, he took. He took. And the Bible actually says he's not ashamed to be called our brother. And we all come from the same mother, right? Yeah. The mother of all living. And he's not ashamed to be called our brother. And it says God's not ashamed to be called our God. <laughs> Woo! He's not. Hallelujah. So we just have to spend more time. We say, well, what's wrong, man? Why can't I get, why can't I get victory over this? Because you're looking at the wrong thing. You're just looking at the wrong thing. You are born again. You do have a new spirit. You are made in the image and likeness of God. You are. You've just been looking at the wrong thing. So you just have to start looking at the Word of God to say, oh, you remember that, um, that movie Peter Pan? Robin Williams was the star. And uh, he got older and didn't go to the boys' island. Help me here. I might have seen it, but pieces. Uh, anyways, and they were looking for him. And I guess he came back, but he wasn't himself. If I remember right, he came back and he wasn't himself and somebody got him to laugh. Somebody, yes, I just heard it. Somebody got him to laugh and he smiled and the little boy said, oh, there you are. See, we just have to see ourselves the way God sees ourselves so we can go, oh, there you are. 
and then you don't have any more pain. You don't have any more shame. Because the reality is you don't have any more pain and you don't have any more shame. That gentleman that doesn't have the arm that was giving him fits, he doesn't have an arm giving him fits. Why would an appendage that isn't there hurt? Why would it? Because there's pathways in the mind. There's pathways in the mind. So the mirror therapy reroutes the pathways in the mind. It's physiologically possible. This is what happens. That's why God knew we had to be born from above, changed, which means we were severed. The old man was severed. We got a new nature. But now that new nature needs to be renewed. Remember, the Bible says, renew your mind. Renew your mind. Form new pathways. Form new pathways. Change the way you think, and you'll change the way you act. Change the way you think. And the way you change the way you think is by thinking the way Jesus thinks. And the way you think that, Je the way, the way you think that Jesus thinks is by reading the word. And it's not just the graphe, the scriptures. You also read the word, the logos, Jesus, what he said, what he did, and the rhema, the spoken word from God via your spirit. Those three things, as you listen to all three of those things, you'll begin to see who you really are. Who you really are. There is no identity crisis with you if you've been born from above because you're a new creature created in his likeness and his image. The, the, the literal translation of 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, it literally means, therefore, if any man be in Christ, let him be. Let him be. He is a new creation. Let him be one. Let him be one. Live from the new creation part. See who you really are. See who you really are. I'm going to check one more thing before I wrap it up. Okay, this is really cool. So, I was like, Lord, I know there's so much more to this, but I just love your word in that it says it's the mirror. It says it's the mirror. And then all of a sudden, he reminded me, as I was meditating, he reminded me of the, the message that pastor just preached last Sunday and he said that we call Jesus our master right and one of the words for master is the master copy and how if you you have the master copy then every thing made from that master will be identical but it's when you try to copy from another copy that it starts to diminish in quality but if you copy from the original master which Jesus is then it will be identical, 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 identical. Yeah. So every one of us is copied from the master. Yeah. So we're identical to the master. Okay. But here's the cool thing. So as I'm meditating and I was remembering that pastor said that, and I thought, man, that's so cool, that word for master. Master, master, copy. And all of a sudden the Lord said, do you know copy machines use mirrors? Copy machines use mirrors. I have to read it to you. Copy machines. I'm like, what? Really, God? That's what he told me. Copy machines use mirrors. And I was like, really? My goodness, that's so cool, Lord. So here it is. A copy machine uses mirrors attached to the lamp. Ha <laughs> ha. Copy machine uses mirrors attached to the lamp and they direct light through a lens. Copy machine uses mirrors attached to the lamp, directs light through a lens and onto the drum be below, transferring the original image onto the drum. So then all of a sudden it made sense, the scripture where Jesus says, um, let your eye be single, what you're looking at is what you become. What you look at, you'll become if your eye is single. If your eye is single. Where is that? 
Matthew 6, 22. Let's look at it. That'll be our closing verse. Matthew 6, 22. You know, I love the word. We use the word um, seed for planting finances because Jesus taught us that that is seed. Paul taught us that finances are seed. But Jesus also taught us that the word of God is seed. So we're planting seeds today that will produce a harvest in our lives. So here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, let's back up, uh, let's back up to verse 20. Verse 20. Jesus is saying, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust does corrupt, and where thieves do not break or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye be single... Your whole body will be full of light. What are you looking at? What are you looking at? You have two division. You looking at your old man? Are you looking at your new man? Or are you just looking at the new man? Are you just looking at the word? Who he says you to be? If your eye be single, your body will be full of light. I'm going to read it in the English or International Standard Version. The eye is the lamp of the body. The eye is the lamp of the body. A lamp gives light. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. Healthy. If your eye is healthy, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, As we behold him, as we look at him, we're transformed into his image. That's mirror therapy. Mirror therapy for the phantom limb, for the phantom flesh that we as new creations often have. It's simply because, not because we haven't been born from above, not because we're not new creations, but because the flesh has memory in our mind. And if we look at it, we resurrect it. But we don't want to resurrect. We've been resurrected. We've been given new life as new creatures. So that's what we need to be looking at. The resurrected, recreated, new, never existed for being made in the image and likeness of God. Amen? Amen. Amen.